Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. The beginning of Allah, bless His name. We praise Him and we glorify Him as He ought to be praised and glorified. We pray for peace on all His noble messengers, in particular the final messenger, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. As we greet you all today from the south of England in the city of Portsmouth, with Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wa Alhamdulillah, today we are all very privileged and honored to have with us Sheikh Imran Hussein. Sheikh Imran Hussein specializes in Ilmul Akhru Zaman, which translates to in English as knowledge of the end times. Uh, in his early years, in his 20s, Sheikh graduated from the Anemia Institute of Islamic Studies and then completed a master's degree in philosophy from Karachi University. Later on, he also went on to the University of Geneva in Switzerland and completed a degree in um, international relations. Alhamdulillah, today's lecture will be about the the Jasad and Dabatul Arq. Inshallah, we are expecting the lecture to take around one hour, and after the lecture, there will be time for a question and answer. And that question and answer will be strictly questions related to the topic only. And a final disclaimer that any views mentioned in this lecture are off the chefs. And I think now I've spoken enough and I will hand over the microphone to Chef to begin the lecture. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Nahmaduhu wa Nusalli ala Rasulihi al Kareem. We begin with Allah's blessed name, as the chairman also did. We praise Him and we glorify Him, as He ought to be praised and glorified. And we pray for peace and for blessings on all of his noble messengers and including the last of them all, the Blessed Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. As we greet you, yes, with assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Our topic is an interesting one, more than that. It's an exciting one. Exciting for those who recognize that absolute truth is located in the Quran, not with the British government, not with the newspapers and television. Absolute truth is located in the Quran. Exciting for those who want to go to the Quran to locate what the Quran has to say about the world today. Who does that today? Do you know of anyone who goes to the Quran? to locate what the Qur'an has to offer, which explains the world today. Nobody does that today. And yet, the Qur'an declares in Surah Al-Nahl that Allah has sent this book to explain all things. And therefore to explain the world, (laughs) the mysterious world today and the world which is yet to come. So good news and glad tidings for those in whose heart there is this thirst for knowledge and who in whose heart there is this love for the book of Allah. Whether you be a brother or a sister, it makes no difference. And you spend (laughs) your whole life devoted to the Book of Allah. That the Book of Allah (laughs) and He who was sent to teach the Qur'an, namely Prophet Muhammad the Book of Allah might teach you and explain to you the world in which we live today. I have been blessed by Allah to do this work for all my life. And I'm able to do it not only because of His kindness to me, but also because 
Allah blessed me with a great teacher who taught me how to study the Quran. And uh, we begin, <coughs> uh, excuse the cough, it was heavy all through Ramadan. It's still there now, the cough. <coughs> Our Prophet, Allah's blessing be upon him, spoke about Dajjal that the Christians referred to as the Antichrist. And he called him al masih dajjal Dajjal, who will claim to be the Messiah, al masih dajjal But the Quran tells us that the Messiah is Jesus, the son of the Virgin Mary. He is the Messiah. So if this one claims to be the Messiah, obviously it is a false claim and he is an imposter. So al masih dajjal is Dajjal the false Messiah. Having explained that term, since it is his mission to impersonate the true Messiah, what would he have to do? Uh, this will be the best introduction of all. I wrote it more than 20 years ago. Jerusalem in the Quran is the best introduction you will have for this subject. But. Uh, <coughs> I did write this book as well, my first book on Dajjal, Dajjal, the Quran and Awwal al-Zaman, Dajjal, the Quran and the beginning of history. And thank Allah, thank Allah, thank Allah, I was able to write this book, which is our subject of our lecture today, Dajjal, the Jasad, and Dabbatul Allah. So, if he has to impersonate the Messiah and to deceive the Jews into believing that he is the true Messiah rather than Jesus, the son of Mary, the Virgin Mary, Allah's blessing be upon him both, then what would he have to do? I cannot in this lecture take you back to the crucifixion. I, we don't have the time to do that. It's just sufficient that they rejected him as the Messiah. Jesus, the son of Mary, they rejected him. And when they saw him crucified, well, I made it appear to them like that. They believed that he could not have been the Messiah, he is dead. And so they're still waiting for the Messiah. This is crucial information for you to be able to understand this subject. My students know the subject very well. <laughs> but those who are new and green, you've got to think. Be careful. You've got to first clean the mind. <laughs> he wants to impersonate the Messiah and deceive them into believing that he is indeed the true Messiah because they have rejected the true Messiah, Jesus, the son of Mary. Now then, our Prophet said, Allah, listen, be upon him about the true Messiah, that he would rule the world with justice, hakamun adlum, wa imamun muqsitun, a ruler who will be just. Ruling what? Portsmouth? <laughs> no. Ruling the world in the sense as having no rival to him. None who can threaten his rule over the world. And this is precisely the kind of rule that Solomon had. 
Naviso de mana de istala. It is in this sense of the word that Solomon ruled the world. Because there was no one on the earth who could rival his rule or threaten his rule. All had to submit to him. Today this is called Pax Suleimani. When you are a ruling state in the world, and none can defy you, none can threaten you, none can rival you, then you are Pax Britannica or Pax American. So. so this is what the Messiah will do. He will eventually rule the world. And he's coming back. This is not the topic for tonight. If the Messiah is to rule the world, he will have to do so from Jerusalem. He will have to establish a holy state of Israel in Jerusalem. That holy state of Israel must become a ruling state in the world. And then the Messiah can rule the world from Jerusalem. This is the easy part of the lecture. Now then, if the false Messiah is to successfully impersonate the true Messiah, obviously he will have to first of all liberate the Holy Land, which is under Muslim rule. Has he already done that? Has he already done that? Yes. I know many people eat the biryani and go home and sleep. <laughs> but there are others who are not sleeping. Yes. He's already done that. Liberate the Holy Land for the Jews. Number two, he have to bring the Jews back to the Holy Land to reclaim it as their own. Has he done that? Yes. Number three, he'll have to restore a state of Israel in the Holy Land. Has he done that? Yes, he has. Number four, he has to cause that state of Israel to become the ruling state in the world. Is that about to occur? So now when when Israel becomes the ruling state in the world and after Pax Britannica has been replaced by Pax Americana and Pax Americana has been replaced by Pax Judaica, only then would the Jal, the false Messiah, be able to stand up in Jerusalem and declare, I am the Messiah. Can you believe it? That this simple explanation, and I remain a solitary voice in the entire world of Islamic scholarship. For long is what? I'm the only voice saying this. Nobody is prepared to come forward and say exactly what I've just said. When this is so plain, so I don't know what's wrong. Is it fair? Is it a lack of capacity to understand? Is it because they are imprisoned in a scholarship that cannot accept this? What it is, I don't know. But I still remain one solitary voice. Ever since I wrote Jerusalem in the Quran 20 something years ago to explain this subject, I still remain a solitary voice explaining what I have just explained to you. May Allah open the way for my students tomorrow, maybe one from Portsmouth, who will dazzle the world as a scholar of Islam, Ami. Now, having established that the Dajjal wants to rule the world from the Holy State of Israel, from Jerusalem in order to deceive the Jews and to declare that he is the Messiah. 
that is now turned to the Quran. And to Surah to Saad, I will not give you the number of the ayah, that's your homework, I just give you the name of the Surah. And <coughs> Nabi Sulaiman alayhi salam is the rule of the world. The holy state of Israel based from Jerusalem is the ruling state in the world. No one can rival it, not even the queen of Sheba. All must submit to him. And then one day, Allah gave him what I recognize to be a vision. And he sees something with the internal eye. What does he see? You and I will immediately understand what happened because of the introduction I've already given you. But the world of Islamic scholarship, all those who have written the tafsir of the Quran, every single tafsir you can find, still will not recognize what this verse, what this passage of the Qur'an is saying. But you will easily understand it. This is our predicament today. بَعَلَوْذِ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ وَلَقَدْ فَتَنَّا سُلَيْمًا Allah says, and we tested him. We gave to him something which caused some distress to him. What was it? وَأَلْقَيْنَا عَلَى كُرْسِيهِ جَسَدٍ And we placed a jasad on his throne. He is the king, he is the prophet, he is he who sits on the throne. But Allah put someone else to sit on the throne. And that other person, Allah describes him as a jasad. So who or what is a jasad? Let the Quran answer that question. The Quran tells us that when Moses, Nabi Musa Islam, when he went up to the mountain, Mount Sinai, Allah called him there, he left the Banu Israel in Sinai. And one of them, known as the Samiri, told them, give me your gold. And he had a degree in engineering, metallurgy, so he melted, he melted the gold and he forged a golden cup. This man had a PhD in engineering. <laughs> and he he forged the golden calf so skillfully that when the wind when the wind blew, the calf would go moo. <laughs> and Allah described that golden calf as a just a, a body without a soul. And now the same word is used for someone sitting on the throne. This can't be a calf, it has to be a human being. Only a human being will sit on a throne. <laughs> so this is a human being, but he does not have the soul that human beings have. That's why he's described as a Jesser. When Suleiman alayhi salam saw him sitting on the throne in a vision, he immediately understood what was the meaning. He was able to interpret the vision. We would take years to interpret the vision. <laughs> yeah. Some of us never, but he, Suleiman, in a twinkling of an eye, he's able to understand the vision. And we are able to recognize his understanding 
his interpretation of the vision in the response that he made. This is proper methodology for study. What was his response? He turned towards Allah for Allah. And then he said to Allah, Rabb, call Rabb Big Firri. He wants to ask something from Allah. And his method is, if he wants to ask for something, he first asks for forgiveness. Setting an example for us. When we want to ask for something, first ask for forgiveness for sin that we have committed. All of us have committed sins. So, call the Rabbi Philly. He said, Oh Allah, kindly forgive me. He's not speaking about any particular sin that he committed. No. He's speaking generally to forgive me my sins. And grant that none can inherit my kingdom after me. You notice how slowly I'm speaking? <laughs> so it will sink in. He recognized that that fellow on the throne wants to inherit my kingdom. He recognized him as an evil being. And he does not want that evil being to ever inherit his kingdom. Who could that evil being be? Who wants to inherit his kingdom? And he is so opposed to it that he begs Allah that none should ever inherit my kingdom. Meaning, when I die, I want my kingdom to be finished, so none can inherit it. You and I would easily recognize that that just that is the job. So then why is it <laughs> that why we can recognize so easily that just that is the job? How come that the world of Islamic scholarship. There's no one else who does that. Mind is still a solitary voice and they're not willing to accept my views when it is so plain and clear. If he wants to inherit my kingdom and he is an evil being, Allah created an evil being, Kul. What comes after? I seek refuge with Allah from evil which He has created. What is the evil that Allah has created? Only the jam. That's the only evil being He has created. So, <coughs> He does not want that evil being to inherit the kingdom. So he makes this dua. Grant me a kingdom which none can inherit after me. But it also has a second meaning. The grant that there will never be another kingdom that will ever be comparable to mine. Two meanings. From this passage of the Qur'an we know this is the first reference in the Qur'an to the job. First reference. There are others as well. But the job is never mentioned by name. You have to have insight. You have to be able to interpret ayat mutashabihat. Verses of the Qur'an which must be interpreted to be able to recognize the verses in the Qur'an which pertain to the Jah. But Allah not only answered the dua and caused the kingdom to collapse as soon as he died, 
but the Lord did something else. He answered this du'a by making this kingdom incomparable by putting something strange. In addition to human beings and angels, Allah has also created the jinn. And amongst the jinn, there are those who are Muslims, they are believers, and the others who are called shayateen. The lots of them in Washington. So, Allah gave orders to the shayateen to work for Suleiman. And if they ever disobey him, Allah punishes them with terrible punishment. And the shayateen are involved in kulla banna in Mughamas, building skyscrapers, tall buildings, huge things, and also going down into the depths of the earth. And when you go down into the depths of the earth, you can discover the diamond veins. You can discover gold. And more important than that, you can discover oil. Are you putting on your thinking capsule? These shayateen, Allah says, up and down. Up and down. So you're going to see, you're going to see in the future whoever has control over the team will be able to do wondrous things up above and below. Okay? And some of the Shayateen are also in chains and they're working for Suleiman. Now we leave Surah to Saad and the vision and the divine response and we go to Surah to Saba and it's time for Solomon to die. And once he dies, this dua is going to come into effect. And in Surah Al-Sabah, Allah says, وَلَمَّا قَضَى سُلِيمَانَ الْمَوْتِ When that time came for Solomon to die, the jinn did not know that he was dead. And they saw someone sitting on his throat. And whoever was sitting on his throat was impersonating Solomon. He was holding the staff of Solomon. And the staff of these two prophets were miraculous. The Prophet Moses, Musa Islam. Do you remember? He threw the staff on the ground and it became, remember? Became a serpent, a stick. Yeah, remember? And uh, this, uh, and he, he took his staff and he struck the rock and twelve streams of water. But this staff, of Suleiman like the staff of Moses, Musa has inside of it a miraculous capacity. And whoever is holding on to the staff is able to deceive the jinn. 
by providing evidence, yes, Solomon is still alive. Look at him, he's walking, he's talking, he's eating, he's sitting, he's standing. How can someone holding the staff do that? That inner capacity of the staff is described in Surah to Sabha as the minsa of the staff. When I was researching this subject a couple of years ago, I taught Minsa. What is this? Because the staff is a saw and that is with sword. And Minsa is with seam. So I consulted some of the best experts in Quranic um, semantics and the Quran of the Quran, uh, the, the Arabic of the Quran, people who had done their PhDs. And the answer that I got from them was that Minsa is the same thing as Asa. That means I is just the stuff. And these are the best experts in the Arabic language, in the Arabic of the Quran. But I was not happy with that. And so I forged ahead all on my own. And I eventually was led by Allah to understand that no, Minsa is not the stuff. Minsa is the property of the staff, the capacity of the staff. That if you are holding on to the staff of Suleiman, alayhi salam, you can enter into time and you can move forward and backward in time. Mm. Because Minsa comes from Nasi, in Naman Nasi um. The system of time. And that was a great discovery. And so now, it was Dajjal they saw sitting on the throne. And because he was holding on to this stuff, he was able to bring movement of time backward and forward and show Suleiman still alive. Today, come and finish on television. Uh, General Charles de Gaulle is dead indeed. But go on television, you see. <laughs> huh? uh, Ronald Reagan is dead indeed. Go on television, you see him walking and talking. Today is come and finish. But at that time, the jinn were deceived. And they will continue to be saved. They will continue to be deceived. Says the Surah to Saba, until when? While the jar is sitting on that throne, and he has control over the shayati, he can order them to do everything he wants to do, cryptocurrency and all. And they will continue to obey him. Are you beginning to understand now the power of the modern West? This is what you're dealing with. And that has not as yet stopped. Because he is still sitting on the throne. Remember this is the vision, eh? The vision. He is still sitting on the throne. The jinn is still seeing him there. He is still giving them orders. And they are under an obligation to obey. And if they disobey, Allah will punish them. So they are on their way. But the Quran goes on to say, that among the signs of, of the last age of Akhirul Zaman, 
is not only the child, not only Gog and Magog, but also the battle of the beast or the creature of the earth. Christian eschatology has it, and we also have it. The battle of. And the battle of this <coughs> is mentioned twice in the Quran. The first mention of Dabbatur Ard is that they would harm mankind. They would cause injury to mankind. Taklimo. And then the second reference to Dabbatur Ard in the Quran is here in Surah Al Salah. That it is when Dabbatur Ard comes. They are released and they start to attack the staff in order to consume the minsa of the staff. Only then will the staff lose its miraculous power. And the Jah will no longer have the shayateen working for him because now they would see Solomon is dead, so we can disobey him. <laughs> Allah will not punish us. When that happens, goodbye to the state of Israel. So then who are the Abbatul Who will consume the means of the staff? I am full of sadness in my heart to have to disclose to you. It will pain you really when you read what are located in the books of Tafsir. Some of the most eminent of the scholars of Tafsir, including in the modern age, they say that, excuse me, excuse me, <laughs> I should not be laughing. They say the Dabatul are the termites. And when Solomon died, no one knew he was dead. And the body was set, sitting on the throne, kept on sitting on the throne for I don't know how many years. No one knew he was dead. Until these termites came and started <laughs> nibbling at the bottom of the staff. And when the staff lost its balance, the staff collapsed and then the body collapsed. And only then did the world know that Solomon was dead. Go check it out. Go and check it out. You will find that this is what is to be found. This is the explanation that prevails in the world of Islamic scholarship. And when I offer this other explanation, which is truth, they resist me. I will be dead and still they will not accept it. What can you do? What can you do with such people other than what I am doing? I'm teaching while still I have life and planting the seeds for a new generation of scholars of Islam who will emerge who will have the courage to extend the frontiers of knowledge. And so that battle art has to be something which can damage and destroy the miraculous inner capacity of the staff. The miraculous inner power of the staff. What can it be that will destroy it? There are many young people who rush forward to say, no, it's 5G and 6G. 
the uh, electromagnetic ray, uh, wave that comes from the uh, wireless internet. I don't even know the technical terminology. But the rush power to say, yeah, this is it. And then when I examine that thesis, I find to my surprise, our prophet said that it's that was fun, that birds flying in the sky, small birds will fall down. Small birds will fall down because they can no longer navigate, because there is a contamination of the atmosphere. When bees can no longer navigate to go to the flowers for honey, and honey production is falling, you know you're dealing with this subject. But something else. Now the most important capacity that a human being has is his capacity to think. Is there anyone who will differ with that? And what is happening now is that our capacity to think is declining. One of the most important components of the process of thinking is memory. And if you look at the children today, a child at the age of 8 and 9 and 10 and 11 has the most powerful memory. That child can memorize the whole Quran at that age. You try to do the memorization of the Quran at age 40, see what's going to happen. But if you try to memorize the Quran at 7 and 8 and 9 and 10 and 11, you can do it. Because the memory of the child is so powerful. Guess what's happening in the world today for people who think, I'm not talking about those who eat the biryani and go home and sleep. I'm talking about people who think. The answer is children growing up in the cities are now suffering a decline in their memory. And so tomorrow you will never have any hafiz of the Quran from a child growing in the city. The hafiz of the Quran will be a child growing up in the village. So there is evidence to support the view of those who rush to say, shake, 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 it's 5G and 6D. I say, yes, you are correct. That the Dab Batul Al that the Quran is speaking about is the electromagnetic waves with which we are now being inundated in the world, which is causing havoc not only to be to honey production, havoc not only to children whose memory is declining, but who knows what else is doing. And this is also destroying the minsa of the stem. I have taken you on an interesting journey today. I'm not boasting. Because when you boast, Allah takes away your knowledge. But today I am unfortunately the only voice in the world of Islam which is explaining the subject this way. And my prayer is that Allah may send tomorrow scholars who will dazzle the world. In the meantime, here is this book, the Quran, the Jal, and the Jasad, which includes the Dabatul and I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala might bless you to penetrate absolute truth in the Qur'an 
So that the Quran might explain to you the world today. I want to stop now because I know the question and answer session is going to be exciting. Thank you. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Jazakallah, Sheikh. We very much appreciate the lecture. And so I think we'll give it a few minutes for the question and answer, just for everyone to think about any questions they may have, they may have for the Sheikh. Okay, so I think for the question I'll say, if anyone has a, uh, has a question for the chef, you just raise your hand and then you can go ahead and ask it. My hearing is declining. So when you ask the question, and he'll have to tell me what's the question. Go ahead.